So, so today I'd like to uh, start discussing, well, start talking about like uh, business optimization in, in general, like giving a tutorial over business optimization. And then, as Mark mentioned in the second part, I will be uh, speaking about some of the recent work that we've been doing in this area uh, and how that we can make business optimization more efficient in when you have like some additional information about the, the problems that we'd like to, uh, to optimize. So the overall uh, well, setting is essentially uh, democratizing machine learning. Um, and so one of the things when you, so one of the things that's happening now today is that, well, there are so many applications, so many demands, so many uh, potential opportunities to use machine learning to automate decisions, to, to leverage data. Uh, but typically there's like a lack of like people being experts in the field. Uh, and one of the, 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 the activities that we, that many big companies are, are doing is trying to like make that, that process more easy to make machine learning more accessible. Uh, and that means also like building tools, uh, for example, for engineers uh, to be able to use like more advanced techniques without having to understand all the details of the underlying algorithms uh, and, and applying and framing the problem and applying some of those uh, machine learning advances in practice. So when you think about democratize, democratizing machine learning, well, there are a couple of things you can uh, uh, look at. So if you, if you consider, for example, on the, I would say like the science part, well, what really matters is to identify what's the right problem. Uh, for example, it's a classification problem, it's a regression problem, uh, it's maybe some uh, a clustering problem. But the actual underlying algorithm uh, is maybe of less, less important uh, to the practitioner. So once you frame the problem, you might say, okay, I want to automate that part and I want like, people not have to worry, customers not have to worry about, about the actual algorithm. The other aspect is the representation of, of your problem, the represent, representation of your data, which is typically called a feature engineering. And that's also something which requires a lot of domain knowledge. And, and in some, uh, like to make it machine learning more widely applicable, well, you'd like to automate that process uh, to some extent as well so that people don't have to find the exact right representation. You want to learn that uh, for your applications directly. So those are the, the two, I would say, two main challenges on the, uh, on the science part. And then there are a number of uh, challenges on the engineering part. So <coughs> when you think about like building new applications, well, you want people not to have to, to worry about, for example, memory constraints or, or network constraints or, or computing infrastructure. Uh, you want all those things to be uh, depending on the need to automatically scale up or down uh, and find the optimal configuration. So today I will not have the time to talk about all those aspects. Uh, I really would like to focus on, on the algorithmic uh, part. Uh, and more specifically, one aspect is that once you have picked uh, some algorithm, uh, some problem, we identified a problem, you've picked some algorithm, uh, there is a lot of work to be done on the, the, the fine tuning of those algorithms. Uh, and one, m many of the things that have been uh, many of the work recently has been to how do we automate that process? And the reason to automate that process is because if you do not, if you not, don't know the details about the algorithms, then you can potentially make mistakes, you can have misunder like a misunderstanding of some of the, of the hyperparameters that you have to tune or the parameters that you, that you have to tune. And so that, that might lead to like bad results. And so automating the process of, of fine tuning algorithms is something that really helps uh, potentially engineers to apply machine learning and applications. So if we step back, if you think about machine learning more uh, generally, you can say, well, what does, we, what, what does machine learning, what's the goal in machine learning? And, and broadly stated, well, the goal is to have, to estimate a statistical model of the data, some data that you've observed. And just estimating the model is not sufficient. The reason to do that is to make predictions. So in some situations, typically in statistics, you, you would like to have estimate the model to interpret, uh, to understand what's happening, what's the underlying process. Here we're more like focusing on, well, prediction. We're interested really in the prediction uh, aspect. And so you would like to have a, a good statistical model so that you can make good predictions on unseen data, which we call that generalization. So what does that mean in practice? What are the steps that you need to go through uh, when you solve like a real problem? So the first step, well, assume that you have collected uh, a lot of training data, collected like a lot of labeled uh, data. Uh, well, the first thing to do is like to model the actual application. What type of model uh, uh, are you actually facing and do you want to tackle? And a very popular and early success of machine learning span detection. And if you think about span detection, well, you want to decide whether some email is spam or not. Uh, and that 
sounds like a, like a binary classification problem, at least in the first, in the simplest version, you can think about it as a binary classification problem. Now, once you know, once you decided to, to model that as a binary classification problem, then, well, there's a second, there are a whole bunch of other choices that you have to make, like, for example, well, should I pick, for example, logistic regression, or should I use an SVM, should I use a neural network, and the, the list uh, goes on. So those are, again, choices that you have to make based on maybe some experience. And, and, and this is something which is typically difficult to do when you're not an expert. The third aspect is, well, how do you represent uh, emails, right? You can you have emails, this is text. So you have like a bunch of text. You can say, I ignore the sequential structure, I just have a bag of words, or I can have like a more fancy representation of that email. And this will have an impact on the actual performance of your model eventually. So the first step is really to model the application, decide about how to tackle the problem. And the second step is then to decide, once you've made those choices, is to decide how to learn the parameters. So there you have to learn, you have to decide about, uh, well, which, uh, if for example, you decide to do logistic regression, well, there are many, many ways to learn logistic regression models. So you have to decide whether you would like to use, for example, stochastic gradient descent, or some more fancy adequate method, or whatever you solve or you prefer to use uh, to optimize. Uh, some objective. And then the, the third step is uh, around uh, is when you're making prediction. And when you're making prediction about new data of the train, with the trained model, is to decide how to actually make those uh, decisions. So often you have a score, and so you have to decide when is the score, for example, in this case, is going to be spam or not. So you have to like, decide maybe about some, some pro so for threshold. Uh, or you have like, to, you want to optimize for different types of metrics, precision versus recall, uh, depending on the application. So there are all the different steps that you need already to, uh, uh, to go through when you, uh, you have a new application in mind or a new problem you'd like to tackle with machine learning. But that's not, uh, uh, that's not the end of the story. Uh, and there is one important aspect there that is not mentioned before, uh, that like, there's much more than just learning the parameters of your model. And one major source of uh, uh, uncertainty or, or that has a major impact on the performance is the metaparameters. So all those models have some additional hyperparameters uh, that need to be decided and, and there's no obvious way of optimizing them. And so this goes like, for example, from regularization, uh, the amount of regularization that you'd like to impose on your model to like the new optimization algorithm, like for example, some, some parameters of your optimization algorithm, some sampling parameters, uh, and the list uh, uh, goes on. So in fact, there are lots of parameters or hyperparameters that you have to decide, and those are going to have a major impact on the performance of your, uh, your system or your actual uh, prediction model. And this is something that is often overlooked, uh, especially when people are less uh, familiar with machine learning, they think they pick a model, they just have a training algorithm, they just run it, and they don't realize how important it is to really do this fine tuning of those hyperparameters. So let's just look at, uh, I just wanted to, to illustrate that with a very uh, a simple uh, toy example. Uh, and so one very simple example is, is digit classification. So let's even simplify the problem and say, well, we would like to distinguish between uh, eights and images, whether they're an eight or nine. Uh, and, when, and let's assume that we already decided to, uh, to use like a relatively simple binary classification model, which is logistic regression. So logistic regression is going to output a score, which is a probability. For example, when you see an image, well, uh, let's say x is an image, uh, and t is, t is, a, is a, it's labeled, so 8 or 9 in this case, well, it will output like a probability that that image is, for example, an 8. So you can decide about the logistic link, which is here shown on the right. So you have like the, the sigma weight function. Um, <coughs> and the simplest model is to say, well, we have a score function y, uh, and the score function is just like a linear sum of well, x is the image, so pixels or some transformation. So phi can be a transformation of that image. So you have a linear score of, for every image that you then put through this uh, squashing function and gives you a probability. Now you, want, you, you need to learn the parameters. So you have a number of parameters here, w here, uh, and w, uh, w, the w vector here, which is going to define your scoring function. And then you have, so to, to, to find the optimal parameters, you, you, can, you have to decide about an objective. And so one very popular choice is to say, well, we can look at the likelihood function. So look at the, the observed data, the likelihood of observing this data. And 
potentially do some regularization, so imposing a prior on the Ws. Uh, and so we can then, for example, then look at the log, uh, uh, log, um, log likelihood of this data set, optimize that with your favorite odd solver, for example, a stochastic gradient descent. Right? A very simple one. Now, this is a, a very simple model. It's like the simplest model you can think of uh, to solve this problem. Uh, you have the simplest uh, objective you can think of, just like the likelihood of the data, the simplest type of regularization that you can think of, which is a Gaussian uh, pry over your weight vector. Uh, and in this case, you will you have, uh, and also a very simple optimization algorithm. So in this case, you already have like uh, quite a number of parameters to tune. Uh, so you have, first you have to take uh, how many uh, times do you go over your data before you consider it to be converged. So what's the learning rate for your optimization algorithm? Uh, what's the amount of regularization you would, you would like to impose? So what's the, the lambda parameter here? Uh, what's the value of the lambda parameter? Uh, and then this is given that you already decide about some uh, objective, some metric of performance, which I just put here to be the area under the curve in correct classification. If you're not familiar with this metric, you can just look it up. It's a pretty standard metric for uh, evaluating classifiers. Now, the bottom line, you have this function f, which is your objective. And in this very simple problem, you already have like a whole bunch of things you have to, uh, to decide in a more or less like... Uh, uh, based on your experience or some other procedure, uh, and you have to set those parameters. And those will have a major impact on the performance of your model. So those parameters here that I mentioned, whether they're part of the, regularis the regularization, uh, uh, the amount of regularization, whether they're all the complexity, optimization parameters, etc., those are globally I call like hyperparameters. And if you think about complex systems that are not within machine learning, you can think about them as a system parameters. You can think of like some big system, some big black box uh, with some knobs that you can turn uh, that will have an impact on the performance of your system. So those are, as I said, those are typically uh, uh, like fixed in some ad hoc manner, maybe using some cross-validation technique uh, or other technique um, or some domain expertise. Uh, and just to have to give you a sense of, of the impact of, of those, the, those hyperparameters, so there was some recent work by uh, uh, Noah Smith and, and, uh, and co-workers who are looking at uh, sentiment analysis. So, so the example I'm, I'm considering now is like, uh, well, here we have like product reviews uh, on Amazon. Uh, and so based on the, the review, we'd like to predict whether this is like, there's like a positive sentiment or negative sentiment expressed in that review. So we can think about that as, as again, being a binary classification problem. Uh, we can, again, uh, consider like the most uh, standard or most simplest approach for solving that problem and, and consider logistic regression. And then you can say, okay, well, let's, just, let's fix the, the, the standard text features, like, like very simple uh, classical features for text classification, uh, and revisit that problem uh, by doing proper hyperparameter optimization. So this, this work is, um, uh, so the reference at the end is like some, some paper on archive, I think it was published since then. Uh, and more specifically, with, well, the hyperparameters that they consider uh, for this uh, sentiment uh, analysis type of uh, uh, application is that, so here those are the parameters of your feature extraction, and those are the parameters of, your, uh, of, the, um, of the training algorithm. So we have, for example, here, uh, we, we con so they considered, for example, some weighting scheme of the different words. So they consider like a bag of words representation uh, with some weighting of the different words. Uh, there's a question whether you remove, for example, stop words, so words are not informative for your classification task. Uh, and then also a bunch of uh, like meta words, like you can look at, you can look at n grams rather than unigrams. So you can look at groups of words together and look at their frequency, for example, and, and weighting them. So there's a couple of um, uh, parameters, hyperparameters for the feature extraction. For the, um, the algorithm itself, well, we, for example, can decide about L1 regularization, L2 regularization, the amount of regularization, and then there's the question, when do we stop the optimization algorithm? And, and this is what uh, they obtained. So they, uh, they're interested in this very simple model uh, and comparing them to neural networks that were a state of the art at that time. Like, uh, and those are the results from about two years ago. So the, among others, they were looking at uh, uh, feed-for neural networks, uh, which are listed here. Uh, 
and then convolutional neural networks and different types of convolutional neural networks and compare them to like plain vanilla logistic regression uh, but optimizing the whole pipeline including feature extraction and optimization algorithm. And what you can see is that effectively this very simple model is matching, is doing better than fit for neural network, but we do the proper optimization and is essentially uh, very close to the, the best uh, model at the time on this particular data set, on this particular task. So this is an interesting observation and, and, and also suggests that maybe it's not always a good thing to, to just directly jump onto neural networks, uh, that sometimes like more uh, traditional approaches are also very effective uh, if they're used uh, appropriately. Okay, so to get those results, they were uh, essentially using Bayesian optimization, which I will uh, discuss in more detail now, or in the, the rest of, the, of, uh, of this session. And so the first thing I would like to uh, is to, to introduce like the actual problem that we'd like to solve. So Bayesian optimization falls into what we call like black box uh, optimization. And so uh, we assume that we have some function here, so this is like the surface of some function as a function of potentially here two hyperparameters, which are continuous. Um, and so we have a function which is, uh, well, which has multiple uh, 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 modes or like uh, optima. Uh, and, uh, and we assume that the dimension here of the hyperparameters here is like relatively modest, modest but like not larger than, like smaller than 20. And so our goal is to optimize this, uh, to find the minimum of this function. Um, <clears throat> but the, the difficulty is that this function, we can only evaluate it, uh, and it's very expensive to evaluate, or relatively expensive to evaluate. So it can potentially take like uh, hours or maybe days to get one observation of, of this function. Or it can be very costly in the sense that it can uh, like harm uh, the system. Uh, if you, uh, anyway. So you have like a very expensive function here that you, you would like to, to evaluate. And you don't have uh, an analytical form per se, so you can only evaluate, you can query the function, and you don't have great information, so you cannot use any standard optimization algorithm. And in addition to that, well, the, the observations can be noisy. So you don't observe it in a deterministic way. There might be some residual noise for every evaluation of that function. So the question is, how are we going to approach that problem, and how are we going to find, uh, well, like the a good value uh, uh, for like a uh, X star here, which is going to be a minimum or like a very um, a good solution, like one of the local modes of that, of that function. So probably uh, the, the standard approach for, appro for, for looking into, like trying to optimize, find a good uh, solution would be, uh, uh, would be the following. It would be to say, well, once you have defined your objective, in this case could be like your generalization error, if you want to, that you would then maximize, or some loss function that you would like to minimize. Uh, then you know what are, you have decided about the model, so you know what are the hyperparameters, and those are the ones that you can uh, adjust. So you can look at a grid uh, of values, of configurations of the hyperparameters, and, and measure uh, this, uh, uh, the, the metric, like the loss function, for example. And you typically would do that by cross-validation. Now this requires like uh, iterating of all the configurations and so, well, there are very standard ways to approach that problem, uh, uh, relatively straightforward ones, and, and the first way is just to have a grid uh, of, of values, right? So this is what people typically do, that, so on the left you have like, looking at, uh, so here again there are two hyperparameters, you have a pretty much more or less dense grid depending on the, what you can afford, what, what your budget. You're going to evaluate every uh, configuration potentially independently, so you can parallelize it if, uh, if necessary. And you do an exhaustive search of the configuration of the hyperparameters. So the challenge is that this is, the complexity here is the exponential number of dimensions. So, so if you have a lot of hyperparameters to optimize over, that's, that's going to be very challenging. And that's also why in practice people don't optimize all of them. So this is why you have the result before of uh, uh, the dimensional sentiment analysis, but typically people do not think about optimizing the parameters of the feature extraction. They just have some rule of thumb to decide which one are good values based on, on previous text classification, for example, uh, applications. So people typically only look at regularization parameter or, or model complexity, which are very important, but they don't pay as much attention to the other hyperparameters, which in the end can have a major impact. So anyway, you, 
you can look at some, some grids and then evaluate the exo exhaustively all the data points in the grid. Or you can do something a little bit more fancy, which would be uh, looking at random points on that, uh, in that space. Right. So you might think, well, why would, would that be a good idea? Is that a better solution uh, than having a, a deterministic, like a, a grid, a regular grid? Well, it turns out that, in fact, this is, this is probably going to be a better approach than uh, this one, although it's like uh, a random grid. Uh, and the reason is that, uh, so if you want to have the details, this is uh, like a paper by, by Berster and, and Benjo on, on optimizing neural networks. Uh, and the reason is that, well, if you look at the profile uh, of, so you can look at the profile of your loss function. Um, and uh, here, let's assume that you have a way of aggregating. So if you're summing, for example, with over one dimension, your loss function, you can have like a profile which is more or less salient or not. Uh, and when you have like, a regular grid, well, you will only explore a relatively few number of values for every uh, parameter. Well, when you have a random grid, well, you will have explored more different values of, of the two parameters uh, respect to this uh, 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 loss function. So when some hyperparameters are not very sensitive to the performance, well, it doesn't really matter. But on the other one, which is, which is much more sensible to the performance, well, you have, uh, you're potentially more likely to have hit like one of the uh, like better configurations. Uh, and so for the same number of, of points that you would evaluate, you typically get a better uh, performance. It's a very simple trick, and it's definitely working and uh, helping uh, in practice. Now the question is whether we can do something better, right? Can we, uh, can we have a more systematic approach to this problem instead of having this exhaustive search of a, a random grid? Um, and that's where uh, Bayesian optimization uh, uh, comes into the picture. So the idea is that it's, again, uh, a global optimization technique. It, it adopts like a probabilistic approach to this, uh, uh, to this problem. So there are essentially two components. The first one is, well, building a probabilistic model of the objective. So the reason that this objective, you, you, don't, you, cannot, you don't have an analytical form. Uh, you can only query it. And so you would like to, for every query, based on those queries, you would like to build a model that can, like a sort of a surrogate model of that objective that you can evaluate at other points that you haven't evaluated in the past. So you'd like to have a, a proxy, and in fact, you're going to, so the idea is to optimize this proxy uh, instead of the original objective. Um, and what's very important there is to have this measure of uncertainty. So since it's a proxy, you, you cannot completely trust it, and there are some regions of space that are more reliable than others. And so you'd like to be able to estimate the uncertainty on the prediction that you would make on the actual underlying function. And the second aspect is that, uh, well, um, we have, when we have like a grid, a random grid, potentially a very large number of points, so the question is how do you select which candidates to evaluate? Uh, and, and this is done typically to, uh, to by balance exploration versus exploitation, uh, uh, and I'll discuss that in, in more detail later on. And this is only possible, again, because we have a proxy that both is probabilistic, so you have like some uh, prediction and some measure of uncertainty about that prediction. Questions? At this stage. <laughs> I can either leave questions for the end or I have like a couple of breaks if people would like to ask questions in between. Everything was clear? Okay, so um, back to Bayesian uh, black box optimization. So our goal is to minimize this function, which is very expensive, noisy, and we don't have the gradient information or the, the, the analytical form. So this is the typical loop of, um, of a Bayesian optimization uh, algorithm. So the first thing, you, you decide about some circuit model. And this surrogate model should be cheap to evaluate. And then we have a set of candidates C, uh, potentially this random grid, uh, but we're not going to evaluate every configuration. We like, we like to only evaluate a subset of those configurations in the end. And then we also have some budget. Could be uh, time, uh, could be uh, some money, could be whatever you can think of, uh, the time to the deadline of your next paper. Uh, and so you have some budget, and you'd like to run this experiment have the best possible model. 
So you enter the loop, and so the first step is to select a candidate. So you, you're going to have like a, among the, the non-evaluated candidate, uh, you're going to select a new candidate uh, using like based on the information you have about your surrogate model, and this is where you have like an exploration exploitation trade-off. And then you're going to you evaluate the model, collect the actual value of uh, the underlying model, uh, the underlying uh, function at this uh, candidate which, as I said, is very time-consuming. Based on that observation, you can update your model, uh, you can update your circuit model, and then you can update your budget, and you iterate until you run out of budget, and you return the best solution that you found in that, within that budget. Um, OK, so one possible approach for uh, uh, building or looking at uh, those circuit uh, models is to look at Gaussian processes. And the idea is that uh, we're going to look, uh, we're going to learn like a probabilistic model F, uh, uh, so probabilistic model of F, sorry, uh, which is cheaper to evaluate. So for those of you that, that, that have uh, looked into Gaussian processes or know about Gaussian processes, they will, uh, they will say that, well, Gaussian processes are pretty expensive in the end, uh, but still they're way less expensive than training, for example, a neural network for five days. So they're, so typically in this case, you're in a regime where you have like relatively few data points, and so Gaussian process scale like cubically in the number of data points, but uh, because it's the actual evaluation are very expensive, they typically a very good type of model for this, uh, this type of problem. So we're going to use like Gaussian process regression. So we have like a, a, an underlying uh, Gaussian process prior. So it's a, you can view it as a prior over function space uh, with some kernel, uh, which defines the smoothness of your function. Uh, and then you have a bunch of observations. Uh, and again, we look at some uh, Gaussian noise. So given your latent function f, well, the observations are going to be Gaussian with some residual noise. So assume we have like this function here, f of x, that we haven't observed, we'd like to optimize. We have some evaluation at some configuration of hyperparameters. We get this value y. Based on that, we can compute some posterior process uh, and collect more data points and then build a model of this uh, surrogate model. So the surrogate model here is this the red curve, which is the mean curve. Um, and, uh, and then we also have like a measure of uncertainty around this mean curve here, which is a shaded region, uh, denoted by sigma. So it's one standard deviation. In this case, three, two standard deviations from the uh, from the mean. Um, three standard deviation. From the mean. Okay, so we have a, a way of, of learning or building a circuit model, and based on at every point here, we have we can evaluate the mean function, we can evaluate the standard deviation function, and we can compute like some, met, some utility functions, acquisition function, we can do some trade-off between exploration and exploitation. And we'll talk about that in more detail later. So if, you, if you're less familiar with Gaussian processes, well, a very simple uh, like high-level view or, uh, of thinking about Gaussian processes is to think about like uh, multivariate Gaussian density uh, or, uh, in, for the number of dimensions going to infinity. So if you look at the multivariate den Gaussian density, well, for d variables, you have uh, some mean vector and so on, covariance uh, um, <coughs> matrix. And the distribution is defined by correlations between the dimensions of that, uh, uh, of that, um, uh, of this vector. So if you think about a Gaussian process, well, that generalizes to like, it's a generalization of this multivariate Gaussian density to an infinite many uh, 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 variables. So an infinite dimensional vector. And so you get like something which is, uh, is called like a, a function. And so the Gaussian process is instead of being defined by the mean and the covariance is defined by a mean function and a, a covariance function. So the nice properties of a, a Gaussian process is that at every, if you consider any finite subset uh, of this infinite dimensional vector, you will have like a consistent Gaussian, a finite dimensional Gaussian distribution. Um, and, uh, and the other nice property is that when you assume you have a Gaussian-like loot, you can compute the posterior process in closed form. And the posterior process is, again, uh, a Gaussian process, which has some mean function and some uh, covariance function. And that's the actual, uh, the actual analytical form. Uh, so it's, uh, it's very convenient in that respect. If you look at the actual, uh, the actual expression itself, well, you have here, you can think about these are the observations. And so uh, the, the, the posterior mean is just like this. This is just a vector, so it's like a weighted sum of the observations, so it's a relatively intuitive solution. Um, and the, the uncertainty, the posterior 
uncertainty of the posterior variance corresponds to the prior uh, variance minus uh, a reduction in variance, which corresponds, which depends on the, the observations. Again, so it's a relatively uh, intuitive solution here. So here, the nice thing is everything is tractable, and you can accumulate evaluations and compute and refine the surrogate model uh, by computing the, the Pasteur regression process. So let's consider some example here. Why is a Gaussian process a good, a good idea for this type of uh, problem? So assume like we have like those, uh, those couple of observations and we would like to, uh, to estimate, uh, like find the mean of, of this underlying unobserved function. So, well, we can sample from uh, uh, the Gaussian process. We can sample functions from the Gaussian process. Um, and so, and then the sample, and the, 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 those functions will be clamped by the observations. So let's have a first, uh, 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 first function sample from the post-regression process based on those four <coughs> observations. And so we have here, this is going to be the minimum of that function. Okay? And we can sample two more functions and look at the minimum, the actual minimum of those functions and, and compute here a histogram of the, of those of the location of the minimum. So again, we have like those, for those three, we have the, the minimum is here, and the two minimum are, the minimum are here. So we could continue this, um, this process, sampling even more functions, and then sometimes the, the, the minimum is, of the, the, the sampled function is in this area or in other areas, uh, and we continue uh, with 100 and thousands of functions that are sampled. So after repeating a process a very large number of times, what we end up is, uh, if you look at, well, the smooth histogram here, uh, you end up with a mean function of all the functions, that, that, so all the sampled functions, and then some, you can compute at every point, you can compute uh, the, the standard deviation. Uh, and so you, again, you have like the mean function and a notion of uh, and the, 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 uh, the standard deviation function that gives you a measure of uncertainty. And we can, have the, we can look at the, the smooth histogram, and what we find is that, well, uh, the minimum of the actual unobserved underlying function is more likely to be, well, in this area here uh, of the input space. <coughs> okay, so this is just like sampling from, uh, uh, from a Gaussian process. It's a pretty expensive way that doesn't tell you exactly where is the minimum, but at least you get like, uh, but you get like a, you, you see why the, the, the uh, Gaussian process does give, is like an intuitive surrogate model for, for this type of problem. So the second, um, the second ingredient is the acquisition function. So the acquisition function is a function A here, which depends on uh, the location. So C is the, the candidates that you've evaluated in the past. X is, X is uh, a, a hyper uh, configuration, and F is your unobserved uh, underlying function that you'd like to optimize. So since you don't observe it, you, have to, you can have this function of, of, uh, which gives like some metric of utility or of one configuration. Um, so you're going to take expectation with respect to F. And so you would like to have like I will talk about like some I give some examples of acquisition functions in the next uh, slide, but this acquisition function is giving you like some value to every configuration when you uh, in light of the fact that you would like to minimize this function f. So the acquisition function is helping you deciding what are the most promising candidates to evaluate, um, and unlike so you you might think about Bayesian optimization uh, also as like Bayesian experimental design uh, where you would like to to query the space and, and cover the space as much as possible. So one difference here is that you, you, you're only interested in the optimum value. So you don't want to cover the whole space. So the acquisition function is going to capture that in some extent to, to some extent as well. So if there are regions that are not very um, useful uh, or unlikely to, to contain, for example, the, the, the minimum, well, you will not query that part of space anymore in the future. And the second aspect is that this is a function that you, you want to optimize. So you can start by grid search, but in fact, this is just a starting point. So you can directly optimize this acquisition function. And that's what people often don't see in practice, but it's a good practice to optimize that function by, for example, some your preferred uh, optimization uh, uh, algorithm solver. Okay, so the acquisition function is making a trade-off. Uh, so 
between, so I, I mentioned that the surrogate model gives you, uh, with Gaussian processes, gives you like a mean function and um, uh, like some measure of uncertainty. Uh, that doesn't tell you how you're going to make that trade-off. Right? And the acquisition function is essentially by taking expect an expectation over some function that depends on the mean and uh, the variance will do this trade-off. And depending on the choice of the acquisition, you will do a different type of trade-off. So why is exploration and exploitation like a trade-off like uh, relevant in this case? Well, one thing to uh, think about that if, if you look at, for example, uh, uh, the multi-arm bandit uh, setting, for those of you that are familiar with that, is, is, a, is a good way of illustrating uh, this trade-off. So let's consider that we have like uh, a couple of slot machines here. Uh, and um, you like to pick the slot machine, which is the most interesting. It's more likely to give you some reward, like a positive reward is going to be the best one. Uh, you're more likely to win by pulling the arm of that uh, slot machine. So assume you have some budget. Well, what you can do is like pulling a number of random number of times from each arm. And then you can record the return uh, uh, of every slot machine. So let's assume this is, uh, this is like the, the return. Mu is the is the, the, uh, your return for every slot machine. So you have like four, four values. Uh, and so if you only think about your estimate at some specific uh, uh, after, like uh, have exhausted one specific budget, well, you will probably pick, if you want to minimize, you will probably pick uh, uh, this, this one. Now that doesn't take, you, take into account the fact that maybe your estimate of the return is not very, uh, can be at some level of uncertainty. Not very the confidence level of might be different for every machine. Maybe because you you haven't pulled like the same number of times uh, the uh, the arm of every slot machine, or maybe some slot machine has some random pro underlying random process that you don't know about. Now, if you look at uh, uh, the other quantity that we have, which is like uh, uh, the uncertainty, like sigma, like the standard deviation, uh, well, and that gives you like the the measure of confidence of your estimate of your return. Well you might have this picture. And that means that in this case, well, maybe you're very confident about the value here, and this is definitely not a good value. Good, uh, this slot machine is not very interesting. But then, then if you look at those two, well, the mean value here is, is, is smaller, much smaller than, than this one, but you're way less certain about this estimate. So potentially, if you had pulled many, many more times the arm of the slot machine, it happens that the return is effectively somewhere here. <coughs> And so this is the, the, the kind of principle that you, we're going to use to identify like good candidates. Essentially, you don't have great information, but you have an estimate of, of the, the value of your configuration hyperparameters, and you have a measure of uncertainty uh, around this, this estimate. So the acquisition function is making this trade-off. Uh, 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 you can evaluate every configuration, and you can then, of your set of candidates, and you can then pick the best one. You can rank every uh, uh, every uh, configuration and pick the best one and evaluate that one. So what are good, uh, what are examples of acquisition functions? So let's assume we have like y, y star is the best value that we've observed so far and we're back in the Gaussian process case where we can compute at every point we know that um, the, the probability of the underlying function given the observation is going to be a Gaussian with some mean m of x and uh, uh, variance sigma x squared, which depends on uh, the configuration x. Okay. So one uh, very natural way of doing this trade-off is uh, looking at lower uh, confidence bounds, uh, and, and that's effectively doing like an explicit uh, trade-off between, uh, well, your mean and your uncertainty. Now what you have here, you have an additional parameter alpha that you have to set, which is like essentially not very useful because we want, like, we want it to be get rid of any of the hyperparameters in the first place. But assume you have like a good way of, of you have a, a additional information, you know which type of trade-off you want to make, well, you can decide about this alpha, and so you can pick one configuration x uh, by computing this quantity at every candidate uh, in the set. Another very popular approach which works very well in Bayesian optimization is expected improvement. Um, so expected improvement is looking at, well, you're looking at the, the, be the, the best value observed so far and subtract uh, your model. And so you're looking essentially at where this difference is going to be uh, the largest possible. Since you don't observe 
f, well, you're going to take expectations here. And so it's really looking at what's the, the, the best value you can, uh, you can pick, uh, given past observations, your surrogate model, and the best uh, candidate observed so far. There are other types of uh, acquisition functions. For example, you can look at the probability of improvement. That's another uh, metric, uh, simply working not as well in, in the case of business optimization, this is my experience. There are some uh, sampling approaches, like Thompson sampling, where you're going to sample from the posterior process or sample a value at every point in your candidates and then pick the one. So you have some additional uh, level of like, a, like a randomness there. And there are some recent work like looking at entropy search, and there are many other ways of doing this trade-off. Now, of course, any peak will make a different trade-off between uh, like, the, like the exploitation and, exp and, and exploration. Uh, and that's, that's like a, one thing you have to decide. Uh, the other thing you have to decide when you look at those problems, you have to decide about the kernel function in the Gaussian process, uh, which there is no good way of, of choosing uh, automatically. So how does that, um, what's the effect in practice? If you look at uh, Bayesian optimization in, in action, so what I have in, on the top is, um, so the, the green line is a true objective. Um, the other line here um, is, um, is the current best estimate. So you have like, we have one observation here. Uh, so we have like the estimate is this, the black line is the mean function. And then again, we have like the, the uncertainty around the shaded regions, the uncertainty around this uh, estimate. And here we have the expected improvement uh, quantity evaluated along the, the, the first, uh, well, this dimension. So we have observed this one. So the expected improvement here is, well, is zero because we know the actual or very close the value of, uh, uh, of the function there. Uh, and so the expected improvement is high in some region of space where we have no information, essentially, at this point. So we can look at what's the best, uh, uh, best candidate. Uh, well, it happens this is going to be the next or next ex estimate, uh, our next candidate to evaluate. So at this point, uh, this is going to be the evaluation. And so based on that, this is higher than this one. So the, the expected improvement is going to be low here. Uh, and again, here we have a high level of uncertainty. So it's probably interesting to look at this, this region of space or to look at this region of space where we have no information. And so we're going to sequentially look at, uh, well, the largest value of expected improvement, identify candidates, evaluate them um, until we run essentially uh, out of budget. And so we see that after a couple of uh, iterations where we converge to, we're going to focus on the most interesting part of space uh, and going to sample, uh, like evaluate function in this region of space and we'll uh, get a good solution. Okay, so to summarize, uh, uh, like the, the canonical loop of Bayesian optimization, well, we, we wanted to optimize this function f, like minimize the function f, like our uh, loss function, uh, which is expensive. Uh, and so first we decided, but we, we picked like a surrogate model, which we took in the family of Gaussian processes, which is cheaper to evaluate than the function f. Uh, we have some set of candidates that are, for example, generated through some random grid. And we have some budget and then iterate uh, over the candidates until we run out of budget. So the first, we decide the candidates. The candidates are selected by doing this trade-off between exploration and exploitation, by computing the acquisition function, optimizing the acquisition function. We collect the evaluation, which is time-consuming. We then uh, update the set of uh, candidates and evaluations and update the, the, the surrogate model by computing the post-regression process. And based on that, we can compute again. We can identify a new candidate and iterate until we run out of budget. Out of budget. Any questions on this part? So you, you mentioned Gaussian processes as um, these surrogate models. So what about other models, maybe linear regression or your networks? And what would work in the uh, case when you have uh, like in the multi-armed bandit problem where you don't have any natural distance and inputs. You, know, you can randomly shuffle the bandits and it doesn't make any difference. So, mm -hmm. so yeah, so on the, 
So I have a slide later on on, on, on the other models. Um, so there are a bunch of uh, very popular approaches. There's like, uh, there's for example, random forest is is uh, is very F so people have used random forest in this context. Um, so the question is, how do you get like some metric of uncertainty? So 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 random forest have been very successful, very practical, and very successful in, in, in this domain. It's called SMAC. SMAC is a library which is available. Uh, if you would like to experiment with it. People have looked at uh, neural networks as well. Uh, uh, the problem in all cases is that you would like to have this measure of uncertainty. So if you look at neural networks, the standard way is to say, okay, we have like a last layer, which for example has a, a basal linear regression model that can compute some, some form of uncertainty that in addition to like the, the actual function estimate. So the bottom line is that any type of model could be potentially used as long as you're able to, to have a good estimate of your your, your objective, your surrogate, and a good me measure of uncertainty. Um, in that respect, Gauss approaches are very powerful, they're very, uh, very robust. So that's, uh, I think, a, a, an advantage of, uh, of Gaussian processes. On the other hand, they don't scale as well if you potentially have a lot of data. Uh, but if you have a lot of data, probably a lot of evaluations, maybe, uh, yes, maybe uh, you, should, you should pick other techniques. So the second question is about uh, what is I would rather frame it as like when we have like hyperparameters that are not have no natural ordering, um, and that's a that's a challenge, especially with Gaussian processes. Uh, so when you have like discrete, uh, so there's one that's having discrete parameters, which in fact happened quite often. So before you had like uh, the, the, in the initial example, you had like the choice of regularizer. Um, so, so how do we handle them? It's not, not always obvious. So the second part that I was, going, uh, that I'm, uh, was planning to talk about, in fact, is well suited for discrete parameters. Um, but um, in general, random forces are very good at, uh, in, in this case, for example. Uh, but yes. So there's not a good answer to that. It's a... Uh, yeah. So are we still restricted to the last minute dimension? So, so you, you, you are restricted, yes, yeah, so you, you are restricted to, uh, when you're restricted, I mean, in practice, you can have whatever, but if you have a, the dimensional, uh, dimensionality is too high, it will be difficult to get, uh, you need more evaluations, essentially. Now, you get, so what you, you're not blindly evaluating them, but it's still, the complexity is still the same. Yeah, so my, my question is, Any model that you, c you compute, so that's used in practice for automating. So if you have, like, assume you have a, a, a any machine learning model in production, you have to retrain it every night. Instead of having someone optimizing it, you can use that to do the, the job for you. So recommendations, think any any application you can think of, spam recommendations, and more fancy models, speech models for Alexa. Yeah. Yes, so, well, the, the advantage of being, having a, a prob like a Bayesian approach is that you can handle, uh, you can automate that process. You have to optimize this. Of course, it depends on the hyperparameters of the Gaussian process. Um, so you can have a fully Bayesian approach where you integrate out over those hyperparameters, which is relatively costly, but given that your evaluations can be extremely costly, typically way less than uh, than, 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 than evaluation that every data point. Um, and then there are cheaper ways of doing that, like typically type to maximum likelihood works very well in practice. Uh, uh, in the beginning, you have to be careful if you have one or two evaluations, but as soon as you have, maybe it, it, is, it makes sense to have a couple of random points, uh, and then it's not over, it's like uh, behaves very well. So you, you can have a, you can optimize them. The only ones which remain, some sense is your kernel and the choice of the acquisition function. People have tried to automate that, uh, like the acquisition function, to look at combinations of acquisition function, but in the end it always makes an implicit trade-off. Right? And that is something that you have to decide what's the trade, how much uh, uncertainty can you afford. 
um, and the kernel is typically you have you, you can have yeah well you can have some intuition about that because this this is effectively like tells you about the, the smoothness of your, your the function you are uh, you're trying to to learn and to realize in practice, we so in, for in real systems we we have some default choice that seem to work very well. Uh, for example, for this this kernel, which is a standard Matern kernel that you would find in the Gaussian process, but which is not which is not too smooth. Uh, uh, well, it's but it's uh, it's relatively smooth. Yeah. Yeah, because your, your kernel function, yeah, if you use the Matern function. Has any impact on your, on your standard deviation? As well. If you change the kernel, you will change the standard deviation. Yes. So, how sensitive is your, are your results to the choice of your kernel function? So, it depends on the, the applications. Um, uh, and, and, and the application will tell you how smooth your function f, underlying function, is. Right? Uh, now, since every evaluation is very costly, um, even if the function was, was very, very rough, you cannot afford to, to, to do many evaluations anyways. And so we favor like, things that are smoother because then you get like, the overall trend and you get a relatively good. You cannot never guarantee you get the optimum solution anyways. Right? So you want to have a good enough, the best possible solution among the ones that you evaluated. So having so the smoothness is, is kind of you can be a sort of a regularization, um, and 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 uh, and you might think of, of ways of uh, increasing the roughness when you have more uh, you get more uh, uh, more data points, but um, so having having a, a relatively smooth function works well in practice. That's that's the bottom line. But in, if you think about what people would do, they would not, I mean, they, they would have a very, if you would like, for example, to optimize manually, for humans it would be extremely difficult to do as well because they would not have the intuition that something is very rough either. Especially they would, they would pick some points and would try to build some, uh, some knowledge about in this domain, this browser seems to be sensitive or not, but they will in the end only be able to evaluate a, a couple of uh, configurations. Uh, whether you cross validation or not, they have to pick them. So it's uh, even for humans, it will be difficult to to do a good job at that. If you have a very nasty function. No. Okay. Uh, I think we we supposed to do a break, like ten minutes or so. Ten minute break. Okay, so, so I think we, I'm going to start again. So I have, um, there are, there's a small part which I haven't had the time to, to do, which I will be, uh, will do very briefly. Maybe it's more like giving some pointers, some, uh, so one is related to a question that there was, so how do we handle hyperparameters? Um, to be specific, I, I, I kind of explain it to, to at least one approach is to look at uh, tra like traditional um, Bayesian, uh, Bayesian approaches, for example, type to maximum magnitude. <coughs> so if you look at, uh, so one approach is would be to say, okay, you can look at the log margin likelihood, so integrate out your uncertainty, like of your latent function, and essentially you have an objective, which is of, of two terms, you have like uh, a data fit term and a complexity penalty, and that's oh, what so you can advise the hyperparameters of your Gaussian process in this way. Uh, I was told now that you will have a session on on Gaussian processes, so I don't have to to, to, to tell you much more. You you, can, you will probably have like a deep dive on, on those things um, in a later uh, session. But anyway, there are different approaches to handle the hyperparameters of your Gaussian process. One of them being like optimizing the log margin likelihood. Um, the second aspect is that when you think about hyperparameters, well, some you might have some prior information you might not know what's the, the correct way of, of uh, like sampling your space. Um, and so you might, uh, so one of the, the, the things that, that you can do in practice is to, uh, it's called warping. 
So you might say, okay, suppose you have uh, one of your hyperparameters is, uh, for example, like a, a learning rate. Well, we don't want to have a, a uniform grid. Uh, you might want to have like a logarithmic grid uh, for the different candidate values. Uh, and so you would like to potentially learn that directly without having more information about the, the, the hyperparameter, you'd like to learn that. And so you can learn the transformation. Uh, and one of uh, the potential choices is like the beta CDF, which is the uh, cumulative density function of, of a, a beta distribution, which is like bounded uh, and, and covers all those types of transformations. So you have things that are quasi-linear to things that are exponential, uh, logarithmic, depending on the choice of alpha and beta. Uh, and so those can be then be viewed as, again, additional hyperparameters uh, that you can optimize to your business optimization procedure. Uh, so that's working uh, pretty well in practice. And then the third thing is uh, that I didn't talk about in uh, much detail is how do we fill the hyperparameter space. So even if we do have a, a surrogate model, if we do optimize, um, uh, we do have, a, we want to optimize this latent function, Effectively, you need to have like candidates, uh, candidates to evaluate. Uh, and so you can, there are different ways of approaching that. Uh, uh, you can potentially do like a random grid, which was the one I was uh, talking about in the beginning. But if you look at uh, pure random, randomly sampling the space, you, you end up with places where you have like uh, parts of your space that are relatively, uh, like not very densely sampled. And so it's uh, a better practice to, to, think, uh, to, to look at um, <coughs> random sequence generators. So one example here is like stubble sequences, where you have like it's a random sequence, but you more densely uh, sample the space in all directions. And that means you have like better configurations that you evaluate. Um, and there are different choices. There are other uh, random, quasi-random uh, random generators for, uh, for sampling, like happy cubes. And then there was also a question about surrogate models. So yes, there are different types of uh, approaches that you can think of. Here uh, we have, like on the left, we have the Gaussian process case. On the right, uh, this is taken from uh, a, a recent review paper on business optimization. And this is looking at a random forest. Um, so in the case of uh, random forest, which is very, very, I think it's very popular in practice, very, uh, very competitive as well, uh, difficult to, to beat. Although it's not as, clear how do you, for example, do this trade-off? How do you compute the acquisition function? So you have to f do some form of ad hoc way of, of having, okay, this is the mean function, this is like the uncertainty. So you can say, okay, my, my function is around the forest. And then you can, for example, do empirical estimates of your mean by taking an average over your different bootstrap samples and same thing, like doing like some empirical estimation of your, uh, your variance at every point, uh, candidate point. Um, and that's the way, uh, the way you can then compute again the acquisition function the same way as before. But there are some cases where you have get some, some straight behavior. So even here in one dimension, one thing that you see is that, well, if you're far away from data points, well, your, uh, if you got the Bastion process, it behaves very well in the estimation of the uncertainty here. You, you end up with like this flat uncertainty, which should in fact increase uh, because you have no information here. Um, Similarly, there might be regions where there are no evaluations where you have like discontinuities that occur and uh, a bit like strange behavior. But once you have enough evaluations and sample space pretty well, those types of behaviors at least do not uh, appear in practice. It's always a good, a good practice to compare to uh, those approaches at least because they're, they're very competitive. Um, so there were a couple of reference material. I will share the slides with Mark. There was a... Um, I think I would recommend this, this review paper that, that's very recent. It's a good introduction to the topic and all the different aspects. Also talking about other surrogate models based, for example, on, on, uh, on neural networks. And there are a couple of tutorials that are online you can find online as well. Um, on the historical part, well, in fact, it's pretty, well, it's definitely, uh, there's a very brief uh, overview. There are two, at least two things I would like to mention. There's like uh, some work early in the, the, the 20th century on, on optimal design of experiments, which is closely related to uh, business optimization, except that business optimization is more targeted to optimizing a function rather than having a good estimate of that function anywhere in space. Uh, and uh, in terms of business optimization with Gaussian processes, I would like to point out this, this paper here, 
uh, in 98, uh, they were like re like revisiting base optimization uh, to, among others, like Gaussian processes already. If you're interested, there is like NIPS workshop. Uh, there are multiple workshops. There is again one uh, this year. There will be several workshops at ICML. And there is a whole bunch of open source packages that you can uh, you can download and try out. Smack is the one using Run the First. Uh, Spermint, GPIOPT, and BaseOpt are all based on Gaussian processes. Uh, and there are all others that I probably forgot. Okay. Any questions on this part? So if not, then I can I can I can move into the real second part. So the real second part is uh, some recent work that we did in this uh, in this area, um, which is still based on optimization using Gaussian processes, uh, but we look at one additional aspect. So this is the same slide as you uh, as I used in the very beginning. Uh, the only thing that changed is that we have a domain of hyperparameters x, which is structured in some way. And so the goal is to say, well, this is getting back to this question, OK, can we handle uh, more than 20 uh, hyperparameters in, in uh, uh, regression processes? In the plain way, I would say I would advise against that. I would always keep it around like a dozen. But if you have some information about how the hyperparameters are structured or dependent on each other, maybe you can go beyond that point. That you can at least handle a larger number of hyperparameters in a, a more efficient way. So let's look at some examples. So the first example is uh, it, like a data analytics pipeline, uh, which is any, essentially any machine learning application. So this is one example of uh, 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 one specific example where, well, we have some input data, you have some feature extraction, um, maybe some, like some processing of inputting missing values, some, again, some, some other pre-processing of the data. Uh, some classification model, some machine learning model, and then a prediction that is made. So you have a sequence of blocks that are, uh, take, that are happening in this pipeline, and typically all of them have some hyperparameters that need to be tuned or are set to some default values, and potentially have, will have an impact on the, on the, on the performance. Um, so not in all cases, but in, in, in some, uh, it, like a whole bunch of real applications evaluating the configure can be uh, uh, very costly. Uh, potentially, if you want to make a change or you want to evaluate, you might you might have to 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 have to to reprocess a big data sets that you've been collecting for years, for example, uh, and uh, and, you, and also everything like some might be taking quite a while to get like some uh, uh, some new evaluation of the whole pipeline, or you might have to collect new data to evaluate uh, it again. So you the whole pipe executing the whole pipeline might be uh, pretty costly. Um, and as I said, I really have like this, they have like hyperparameters in every block uh, going from like a feature extraction, dimensionality reduction, uh, type of classifiers, et cetera, et cetera. A second example is, uh, what is deep learning. Uh, and so in this case, well, we can look at uh, convolutional neural networks, for example, where effectively we have, um, we have a sequence of layers uh, and in every layer we have some hyperparameters that need to be decided. And in fact, it might be that there's some, some dependency. So if you decide about the number of, um, you, need f you, first, you first need to decide about the number of layers before the parameters in your uh, third layer matter, because if you decide you have only two layers, well, of course, you don't have to optimize them. But there are some dependencies and something that can be shared, like if you have a growing, an architecture of growing size, you might think that, well, this, there is maybe the structure to learn the first two layers will depend uh, on what happens on the on the the, the bottom layers, or the top layers. So measuring the quality again, the quality is also very uh, very costly. Today you have like a really very large data sets. You need a lot of data to evaluate. And deep learning can be some training, some training, uh, training some models can take up to months, uh, uh, so weeks, uh, more than days, but it can take up to weeks. And um, and the type of hyperparameter that you would have to uh, to look into and optimize our number of hidden layer, activation functions, uh, regularization, dropout, uh, anything you can think of that you currently have to optimize in, uh, in deep learning. So what is a, a structured uh, search space? So essentially you have like a, a, a space which is uh, a product space, so you have a conditional relationships between, uh, between the hyperparameters in some way or the other. 
and, 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 and what we assume here is that we know this conditional structure, or at least we, it's given. So you have, you have to decide about it. So if you look at the data analytics pipeline, well, we have, for example, we can say the first uh, hyperparameter is a classifier type. Well, if you decide about logistic regression, then you have x1, th this hyperparameter. And if you decide about random forest, you have a whole bunch of other hyperparameters. So here you have this conditional dependency. Uh, if you think about uh, a feed for neural nets, well, as I mentioned, the hidden layers, if you first have to decide, you have a dependency of the, the decision of the number of hidden layers on the hyperparameters that do matter uh, uh, in the first layer or the third layer or the second layer, etc. Right. So you have a, this conditional structure that, that you would like to exploit uh, when we uh, do hyperparameter optimization. So making it a bit more concrete, so let's look at uh, this example of a feed for neural network. So the hyperparameter we consider is number of hidden layers, which in the experiments that we consider to be between 0 and 4. Uh, regularization parameter, uh, which number of units in, in uh, layer J, which can vary uh, per layer. Stop, stopping criterion when of the training algorithm. We're using Adam, so we have uh, like uh, two, two uh, parameters for your um, optimization algorithm. We have also like normalization of the data, like uh, some form of normalization, and the activation uh, function can be ReLU, can be your preferred type of activation function. So all those hyperparameters can be chosen either globally or can be chosen per layer. Okay. Uh, and so what we have here is like we have a, a dependency, like a, a decision tree, where L is the number of hidden layers. So if you have, well, zero hidden layers, you only have one set of those hyperparameters. If you have uh, one hidden layer, you have this and this set of hyperparameters, which, uh, which is all the ones I, I mentioned before, uh, etc. Right? So you have some dependencies here of this uh, number of layers. It's like the kind of the decision variable that tells you what's, that there's some dependency between the hyperparameters and and how many do matter in your optimization. Does that make sense? Okay. So the naive approach would be to say, well, we, we just ignore this structure. We just don't take that into account. And what we can then do is just to say, well, we just concatenate all those, uh, all, all those hyperparameter sets um, into a very big vector. Um, so it's a joint model. It ignores the. Uh, the condition dependencies, which is like a, a, a reasonable choice in, in the first place, um, as a baseline at least, <coughs> but which is uh, to some extent problematic because in the end, if you want to have a good prediction or good like surrogate model at every location in this leaf, you need to have a number of evaluations there. Right? A number of uh, so that means that in this setup, because it's very high dimensional space, you probably have, need a lot of evaluation or more evaluation that if you're not, you would uh, uh, exploit that structure. Uh, and so given the fact that Gaussian processes are cubic in number of evaluation, this is potentially going to run uh, to, to make, to, to, to lead to some practical problems when you want to use uh, Gaussian process in this context. Another uh, baseline would be to consider independent models. So again, you can ignore the structure uh, and essentially you think about so you can look at every path in the, in the decision tree. And so you have one Gaussian process residing at every, uh, every leaf. So it's one Gaussian process over this set of hyperparameters. You have one per leaf. Uh, and, and so you can run based on optimization independently. You just have to, you have to, every time you have to sample the candidate, you need to sample from every leaf. So that's a bit of, a, of work. And then you decide which one is the best. Uh, you can, and you can continue this way. So, there's no sharing of information in this case. Um, you have to compare the, the, the acquisition functions for, for every leaf. And so the, the, the nice thing about this thing is that, well, the complexity is, depends on the sum uh, of the cubic complexity at every leaf. So typically you're going to have, even if you have the same number of observations as in the previous case, the complexity is way less than in the case of the, 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 the other baseline, because you don't pull all the, um, the evaluations together. Okay. Okay. And so the uh, the extension that we considered here is like a, a tree structured uh, sharing uh, of information 
So what we would like, so you can think of it as uh, as a previous uh, like independent model approach, except that we would like to couple like paths that are overlapping uh, in these three uh, to some extent. Uh, and the way we do that is that we assume that we have like a, so V is the number of nodes in the, in the tree. And we're, gonna, we're going to as associate every node to, um, uh, to a wave vector C. Uh, and we assume that this, uh, like that, that this vector C is drawn from a, a zero mean Gaussian distribution with some covariance matrix. So, what does, uh, so how does that look in practice? Well, now we have like this additional latent variable C on which we, have con we can condition for every path. And we will add some contribution here, which is a sum of those weights along the path uh, uh, of, that, uh, of, of that Gaussian process. Right? So, so you have like here, you have a C0, C1. So for, uh, for, for the case of here, you would only have like one C0. And in the other case, you will have sum of all the, the Cs along, along the, um, the nodes on that, uh, on that path. Right? And this is added then to the... Um, uh, to the mean function. So this means that this set of, that this vector C is shared by all uh, the paths, at least a subset of them. And so you have some sharing of information uh, in this case. So which means that uh, if you look at P and P, uh, so for example, two paths, P2 and P3, well, part of, so they have like the contribution, the sum of, of those weight vectors. So there's some part of that sum that is the same in the both cases. There's like the longer path, we have some additional terms compared to the previous one. In terms of complexity, we, it's interesting because it's, it's getting close to the, closer to the, pre, the, the one where you're agnostic about the tree structure. So you have like independent Gaussian processes. Uh, so your cubic, um, <coughs> uh, sum of the cubic number of elevation every leaf, plus some additional cubic term which depends on the size of your, of your tree, uh, which is in all cases uh, way better than having the cubic uh, term in the sum of all the evaluations. Now, to give a bit intuition about what's, uh, why this is a good idea, um, so I mentioned earlier like that uh, you can compute like the mark, like, well, I mentioned another context, but if you look at the Gaussian process, you can integrate out the, uncertain, the, the, the latent functions, and then you end up with uh, a marginal likelihood. So the marginal likelihood is, uh, and you can integrate out both the latent function f and the latent function, the latent weight vector C. And if you do that, then you end up with this, uh, this Gaussian distribution, multivariate Gaussian distribution. Um, and if you would not have C, you would just have, you would have this term, which is the classical log margin that you would uh, end up with when you look at, uh, when you consider Gaussian processes. Now here you have this additional uh, correlation term. Uh, and if you work out the details of that correlation term, well, you end up with uh, the following interpretation. You have something which corresponds to um, the, uh, which corresponds to, it's called the intersection kern. So the additional correlation on the diagonal is just like the length, uh, corresponds to the length of your, uh, a weighted version of the length of your path. And when you look at cross correlations, so <coughs> the correlation between observation in two paths, you have uh, a weighted sum of the length of the overlapping part of those. Uh, of those paths. So you, the more there is overlap between the path, the stronger uh, the, the stronger the correlation, uh, there will be a strong correlation between, between observations, so increasing this correlation. So this is how you have, uh, you're sharing information between those paths. So because if you essentially in this neural network case, you can assume that there is some information that goes uh, uh, on the hyperparameters, some information can be transferred if you have a bigger network like an, with an additional layer compared to one way has like one a bit smaller network. The other aspect is that we, uh, uh, we, we can think about uh, a two-step acquisition. We can also simplify the acquisition function. So we could, in the simplest case, we can say, well, we would like to um, decide about uh, the new candidates by just applying standard, for example, expectation improvement. Uh, but that is going to lead to the same complexity as the, the naive case where you pull together everything. So instead of doing that, we, we, we take two steps. So first, we select the path, and then uh, we're going to select uh, uh, the most promising candidate along that path. Uh, and so you have like a first, like a, what we call like a, a path expected improvement, which is essentially going to look at the benefit 
that you would have uh, by picking up that path. So like you have a mean function value, so which is the mean, the sum of those uh, of the weights along that path. Uh, and then once you've decided about the path, you can just do regular the regular procedure as before. Is that uh, any questions? What you collect in the data set, right? Because each path is, you do hyperparameter optimization, right? So you're selecting candidates. So every path has a set of evaluations corresponding. So if you think about uh, a set of evaluations corresponding to that, uh, to that path, essentially the leaf. It's not the, the, the path itself is the leaf. Right? You end up, by right, every path in the decision tree corresponds to a set of hyperparameters. If you think about, uh, so if you, you think about that too, then you have the concatenation, you have like those hyperparameters do matter, right? If you, in this, this leaf, then those hyperparameters do matter, right? And those hyperparameters correspond to the ones that are defining, that are going to help you learn, but it's a fine tuning of, of that layer of, of, of your neural network. The coefficients C are. Relate these so you can view that this way. You can say, okay, there is one C associated to every, for every, every. There's one C associated to every set of hyperparameters, if you like. And so if you're in, in this path, well, you have like a neural network with, with two layers. Right? So you have like this set of hyperparameters and this one and this one. And you have you have like a C you have all the C's corresponding to the nodes up to there that we contribute. So you have an additional bias that that, that contributes uh, like a, and that depend that is shared between higher higher uh, higher levels in your in your tree. Okay. Any other question? Okay. okay. What's yes. the size of C? Because you have so many paths in the tree, and that's like, uh, is that a kind of like absolute exponential growth in terms of like number of paths? So, um, no, C is just like the, well, you have one C per, per node in your tree. Okay, so it depends on the size of your tree. The tree typically are not crazily big right because you they're not like uh, generated in a random way like if you, you think about the neural network even if you have well this is like a very long tree in the simplest case you could decide about another tree but typically well it's the, the maximum depth is the the maximum number of layers in your neural network it can have big neural networks but as far as i know it's not going to be like 10 million um and if no, but the number of nodes depends on the depth of the tree. Okay. Uh, yeah, and 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 typically depends on. Of course, it depends on the branching factor, etc. But this is like it's not like uh, uh, the, the the dependencies between the hyperparameters is, is known, right? It's typically based on some some concrete model, so it's not like exploding. Uh, typically exploding. Well, there may be some cases, and then probably that will cause a problem. Right? Typically, the number of nodes v, for example, is is way larger than the number of evaluations per per per, per leaf. Hmm? Yeah. I, am I right in C v that v corresponds to a set of parameters? C v is in some sense the average performance, <coughs> including those parameters, or the average sort of additional. Yes, uh, uh, you could read this way. I, I don't know if it's like an average improvement. It's like a, a contribution, yeah. like it's like a, a, an average, like a, a latent contribution, constant contribution, depending. Uh, yeah, exactly. In a, in a sense, you're capturing the average. Yeah. 
to capture the best of, of um, the, best the best configuration? The best performance yeah. of that included. We haven't considered that. Um, the, um, we haven't considered that. So, so, so um, I think that the, you could potentially think about some variants of that. The question how you formulate the model here. When you do it this way, you have this essentially latent, vec lat latent vector. You can, you can impose some, some, some prior distribution over that, and you can do all the inference. In, in the case of, of changing the interpretation of, of C, it would be, less, I think, less obvious to me how you, you do inference in the model. But yeah, you could potentially think about like doing uh, uh, like optimizing in some way or the other the, the objective. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So as I said, this can be has some interpretation of like uh, uh, of the, the intersection kernel, which is in fact used in, in other settings, uh, in particular in natural language processing, uh, when we compare like. Uh, for example, if, if you look at parse trees and, and you want to compare like similarities between, for example, parse trees and things like that. Okay, so we have a, a, a two-step acquisition function, which is more uh, efficient than doing the the full thing unconstrained one. So being two steps, at first selecting the path and then selecting the candidate per path. So it's also an advantage in the sense that uh, if you look at the independent one, you we would have to select and rank candidates across all. Uh, the path. In this case, we don't have to do that. We don't have to consider uh, the alternative path once you've selected the path, um, which is also uh, slightly uh, less expensive. So, <coughs> so how does that? Uh, how does the look? The, the experience look like in in some uh, uh, real examples? So we looked at uh, well classification with a, a plain free for neural network. Uh, it's a binary classification. It's like all the data, like 45 data sets from from the Libes VM repository. Um, and then we uh, we show here so iterations number of evaluations so number of times you evaluate the whole function and you train the whole model um, and the mean rank is so so for every uh, data set we're gonna rank who's performing best um, and then we take the mean rank across uh, the four uh, the forty five data sets uh, and what we compare to is like the three based one is the one that I just described. Uh, SMAC is the random forest based one, uh, which is this purple one, plus some uncertainty which we repeated it multiple times, so we have some, some error bars around this uh, performance metrics. The independent uh, baseline, uh, the random baseline, which you might see is like pretty competitive for a very simple uh, approach. And then uh, we have also ARC, and the ARC kernel is like it's a, it's a paper, it's listed in the references, it's, so it's, uh, it's, you can view it as a global one but has like a, a design, the kernel is designed to be able to leverage the dependencies. Um, but the problem is that the, the complexity is, you, you, you're, you're working in a space, a, high, a much higher dimensional space. Uh, so still it's, a, it's pretty challenging. And so what we see is that the, the, the tree-based one is, is a, has an advantage, is pretty quickly uh, winning in most of the cases in the, uh, in the benchmark and sticks at the minimum. At some point, there is some catching up because all all techniques in the end will find if you if you run them at sufficiently long, they will all at some point catch up. They will always be very close, so it's so becoming random, which is the best one. Uh, so what matters is really the sooner you can find a good solution uh, that you will be going to be on top. I mean, of course, this doesn't tell you how much better the solution is; it just tells you that it's more often winning against uh, the other uh, approaches, which indicates that there is like a benefit of leveraging the structure. Uh, in any case, okay. So I'm getting to conclusion. So I was maybe a bit faster on the last part, but than I thought, which may be a good thing. <laughs> um, so in conclusion, so, I, so the goal was for me today to uh, talk about Bayesian optimization in general. So I hope uh, the message was uh, uh, came across of saying, okay, you I view Bayesian optimization as the second layer of machine learning, essentially using machine learning to optimize machine learning uh, by building, learning those surrogate models. That's effectively what we're doing. Uh, Gaussian processes in this case are very effective because you need both like an estimate of your underlying and observed function and you need a good estimate of your uncertainty as well. Um, and, and there are a whole bunch of use cases. So, so we talked about, uh, so you can optimize the algorithm, uh, but you can optimize the model as well. That's, so, so you can, 
or you can optimize something which is not even uh, maybe like some, some full pipeline. Uh, and you can go beyond that and you can say, okay, I can maybe optimize things that are not even machine learning models, just a black box with some knobs that I can turn uh, and I can use that as well. So I think the variety of, of problems you can apply to is, uh, is pretty broad. And I think in general, like people, of course, can do hyper priority optimization themselves. And it's not quite difficult. It's just like time consuming. It's like it's taking time to do it. It's, it's you have to collect the data. You have to, uh, you have to, it's prone to errors because it involves some manual processing. So I think it's, it's essentially um, giving you a, like more time back, which you can then use for more interesting stuff. Uh, I think that's, that's one of the main, uh, main benefits. It's also preventing to some extent, um, people from from having a false like interpretation of the actual underlying algorithm and then trying to optimizing it in the wrong way, because effectively it's taken care of in an autom automatic way by the business optimization procedure. I think the second aspect, which I uh, I think is interesting about business optimization, is that it's a model-based approach. Uh, so you so since you have a model, you can start adding, making the models more or less complex and and incorporating, for example, the prior information that you have about, uh, about your specific application domain. Uh, give the example of a dependency, <coughs> dependency structure. There are definitely other ways of, of, of boosting the performance uh, and, and, and resolving problems, for example, that in higher dimensional space of leveraging any dependency that you might think of. What I didn't think I talk about, which is in the paper, uh, is uh, the fact that, so I talked about the, the tree structure and having some uh, some additional weight vector that's contributing and, and capturing some correlations between uh, different uh, configurations of, of the hyperparameters. Uh, what we can also do with this architecture is can share some hyperparameters. So you can say that in addition to have a C at every node, you can say, I can decide to have layers, for example, below the second layer, like some uh, the, the, the algorithms uh, hyperparameters, the same for all the layers below that. So you can modify that to have more um, Prior that are not only residing at the leaves, but also residing higher up the tree and are shared by the different configurations. Okay. The code is in GPIOPS, and uh, and here are the references. So, if there are any other questions, I can try to answer them. So I think the, um, when I'm talking about that, because I think it's, in, it's an important topic and something that we, uh, so Democrat, I mentioned in the beginning, uh, making ML more widely applicable um, is important you know, because there are so many opportunities, you cannot do everything, and that's really uh, helping automating that process, this painful aspect of hyper optimization. So I, I think that this is very effective at doing that, uh, and so we work on that because this is, has a direct impact on on, on the application that we work on. As I said, this is like giving time back to, to, to for example, engineers or scientists that would not have to do that otherwise. So they can, they can think about the actual problem they would like to solve rather than spending time in, uh, in, in optimizing, uh, fine-tuning their models. Uh, and in fact, it's not only often, when in practice what we've seen is that it's not only giving time back, but it's also often leading to more, uh, sometimes better uh, uh, better solutions because people um, just like l are uh, like basing their their evaluations on previous work or previous experience, and so I might be some trying to shortcut and gaining time. And then they don't like, for example, in data in the data science pipelines, it's very unlikely that it's very rare that people optimize everything at once. They always optimize every block independently, or just don't even optimize a block because they think it's not impacting the performance. So in that respect, it's one, it's giving time back. Second, it's, uh, it's uh, regularly like getting you better performance. Uh, 
Um, and so, and it's really removing a pain point. When you, so in that respect, that's why it's important. I think it's like removing a pain point, and there are many other pain points when you, you build applications. Uh, but that's one of them, like, uh, and that's an important one. And that's why I think it's important in the democratization aspect. Mm -hmm. And the second question was, I forgot. Like, what are the biggest challenges to continue pushing for automated? Now think about the biggest challenges if you automate that, you, you get, uh, if you look at the paper, for example, the review paper on business optimization, it's like getting the human out of the loop. I think we have to be careful in getting humans completely out of the loop. We have seen recently, you know, some biases in data that reflect in, in, for example, predictions and algorithms. So the algorithm that's the problem, it's the fact that there's biases in the data. So when you, the more you automate, the more, the more we have to think about how do we make systems robust? Uh, how do we remove biases uh, from the data? How do we uh, guarantee like the privacy uh, aspects? So I think that, that those are all the challenges that, that come up once you remove manual intervention. This one here. I'm trying to understand um, if we are actually capturing the proposed areas between inclusion. Or, so if we have two different sets of parameters, then the, the, the covariance of including both of them is included in our, yeah. in our calculation. Yes. Sorry, short question. But that was, I, I, no, that's, that's right. I have another question, actually. <laughs> um, but maybe a better question for, for the room. Have you thought about other structured, structural features that you might be able to exploit? For instance, say in a deep neural network, the parameters between layers that are adjoining one another may have more uh, subtle or predictable influence on one another than parameters that, that are existing between the, the one very deep layer and one shadow. Yeah. Um, no, we haven't really uh, looked into that. Um, um, except that to some extent, uh, the fact what I was saying about you can you can consider. So in this structure, in the, the, you, you have the C's. You can put, you can look at uh, where you can some set of shared parameters. And so you can say, okay. I would like to have some shared parameter, hyperparameters for these first three layers, and then some shared for the second, the, the, the sixth up to like three to six, uh, fourth to, to sixth layer, etc. So you have a way of of tying them together, if you like to. Now, th this will not be automatic. So you have to it's a prior intuition on how you you would like to to share the information. So we've tried. So the thing on, on so there the are a couple of things on sharing, and and so once you do sharing, in fact, you you're changing your tree. In some way, in some way or the other, and 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 there are an infinite number of, of choices. Uh, some have an impact that, like a more or less impact, and, and in the experiments we saw that some very intuitive, or in for us at least, very intuitive variants did not have uh, a major impact on the performance, and some less intuitive one did did better. Uh, well, yeah. Yeah. Well, you can, you can view that in some sense you, you're removing some of the, the hyperparameters from your kernel, in, which is in the kernel, and you have the have a linear term of them. Right. Uh, so, we, so, so in that respect, you can, uh, or you have like a cur an additional kernel. Like you could think about like a basis function expansion as well, which we have in the paper, um, that would capture these correlations. Uh, essentially, you can view that in some sense you're removing them from the global thing. If that answers the question. Um, it's more the, so it's not quite 
Good. Right. So, so if you're in higher dimensional spaces, you need more, way more uh, evaluations to do a good job at estimating your objective function. Uh, so I think this is a fundamental. This is a curse of dimensionality. So there is no. So so there is, there is no obvious way of of, uh, of solving that. Um, so I think if you have a very large number of of, uh, of hyperparameters becoming. So for example, this is some 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 of the the misuses uh, uh, that people have tried to use. For example, this thing is like, for example replacing using that instead of an opti a solver. For example, you say, okay, it's it's optimizing. You can in fact. In theory, you can op you optimize anything, but it's a very bad idea to use bin optimization to instead of like a LBFGS, uh, you can use LBFGS. Right? Um, so, so anyway, so, so the, the bottom line is that if you have like a, a very, I don't expect the problems to be like a tremendously high dimensional, uh, but um, the only way to get around that is to try to leverage some some structure. Um, otherwise, which effectively means that your your hyperparameters are living in a low dimensional space, even if they're in a very high dimensional space. Right, that's the way to, to, to handle that. Now, if you think about the, 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 the more the question about the number of evaluations, there are settings where there are lots of tons of evaluations, or settings where one evaluation is cheap, and then probably you should use other, other techniques. So you spoke about democratizing machine learning, kind of like talked about uh, effectively automating a lot of stuff. And mm -hmm. that is, I think is very helpful for, for people who get started with machine learning and also startups to, to try a few things out. But another thing that comes with this is data. Yeah, so is there also something, um, you know, are there some, what are the initiatives to making data sets available in order to try things out and see whether maybe my new startup is going to be uh, promising or not? So, at, at, well, I think in general, like, getting data available is something which is very, uh, so very I think it would be good to have more bigger data sets available. It's a very tricky bit. Um, so I can say that there was, like, some initiatives as well on, on like, hosting data sets. That is, like, uh, on AWS, for example, there are some initiatives to Host big data sets and, and maintain and making them available, helping people use them and leverage them. Uh, recently, I was discussing like like on satellite data, for example, very big satellite data, and there will be efforts to do more of that. Um, I think in general, the data aspects is uh, is the, is probably the most critical part, more even than than the actual underlying algorithms. Um, yeah. I think in, in the I, I don't view that as a it would have. It can potentially. Um, it, does, it would contribute to democratizing ML. I think there are other, also many other components that would help, uh, like uh, which would then not like, for example, offer like I think it's like sort of a resource like the data set, but for example, tools like uh, labeling, helping people label data in a more effective way, which means that they could collect it in a much more effective way. And this is like other uh, pain points that we definitely look into because this is. This is a difficult one for any any team, any person starting a new application, whether in a startup or internally in a big company or or, or in your uh, in your research uh, work. Right? Um, and so I think that's another way of of democratizing the data collection in some sense. Okay. okay so if there are no more questions, questions then uh, thanks a lot. Thanks for staying.